Faith Baptist Church. And uh, while a whole lot of folks are staying in place, I'm so glad you're here. It makes my day, and I hope it'll make your day. We are going to record what we do here and then upload it later to Facebook if someone wants to see Faith, uh, Faith Baptist Church later, and that'll be great. So thank you all for being here. It, it'll be a really good thing. We're, we're going to go through uh, the worship service very similar to what a normal worship service is. So we're going to get started with a call to worship opening song called I'm So Glad Jesus Lifted Me. <clears throat> we'll sing the first verse and then the Satan Had Me Bound verse and then the first verse again. I'm going to go play it on the piano. thinking the wrong thoughts, living the wrong way, but you reached down in love and you lifted us up out of the mess we had made of this life. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can remember that time and then we can remember that you live in our hearts today and you've got a home prepared for us in heaven and we can live for you and we can shine for you and we can represent you in this world. Help us, Heavenly Father, to do that. We come to you this morning also, Heavenly Father, with worries and cares and burdens and difficulties and life situations. Our nation is having a crisis right now because of a virus that's sweeping from coast to coast. And Heavenly Father, we're praying for the leaders of our country, the leaders of our health care system, the, the common sense of the people of America to prevail, and that you, through your Holy Spirit, would cause us to win the victory over this crisis. Come out stronger than ever and be a stronger nation than ever as a result of having gone through this trial. Your word says to count it all joy when you encounter various trials and difficulties. And so, Heavenly Father, we're counting it all joy because you give us the joy in our heart that we live by. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you all for being here. So we're going to sing a little bit about the love. Uh, first of all, we're going to sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And then we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me. This I know. Uh, and then we'll go into our sermon time after that. So let me... Let me go back to the piano and the words will be on your screen. We'll start with Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. All right, if y'all stand, we'll go with Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
You're about to hear from our associate pastor, Mr. Curtis Ward, and you will, after you hear from him, you'll know why he wins awards at Southern Crescent for education. Uh, and I appreciate, he's all modest, he's like, Jeff, why would you say all that? Uh, so I'm going to read the scripture. It's the next scripture in our series through Matthew chapter 19. And it's, this, it's a familiar scripture called the rich young ruler. And uh, we, we call him the rich young ruler because that's how we compare him to the other different characters that meet up with Jesus and receive instruction from Jesus. Uh, I'm sure he didn't call himself that uh, because he thought he was a very important person. And so as we read this, I want you to hear the scripture. It'll be up there on your screen. And uh, I'll read it out of the New King James, Matthew chapter 19. And here we go. Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler goes like this. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So just by way of introduction, let me tell you a couple of things. You remember last Sunday where we talked about units and how Jesus said, you know, you disciples who want to divorce your wives for any reason at all, so you might think about it might be better for you not to marry. It might be better for you to be single. And Jesus went on to describe there are some who are units because uh, not by choice, but because someone has surgically altered them. There's some that are units because they're born that way. And there are some that are units because... They have consecrated themselves to the Lord as single men. And they want to serve the Lord as single men because that's what they were called to do. Well, I want you to know that one of the early church leaders, whose name was Origen, O-R-G-E-N, who was the head of the church in Egypt, the Coptic church, he took what Jesus said about eunuchs so literally that he made himself a eunuch so that he couldn't father any children, he couldn't uh, fulfill the duties of a husband, and he surgically altered himself, thinking that that would make him more holy. And some people take these verses about the rich young ruler, where Jesus says, well, you need to sell all you have and give to the poor and come follow me. And they think that Jesus wants every single person who calls the name of Jesus not to have any money, to take a vow of poverty, and to live as a poor person among people, that that will get them into heaven and make them holy. And I want you to know these, in order to understand what Jesus says to the different people who he encounters as he goes along the steps of the three years of his ministry, in order to figure out what that means to you and to me, we have to first understand what it meant when Jesus said it, and then try to apply what it meant when Jesus said it to us and our circumstances, which are entirely different. And Curtis is going to help us do that this morning. Thank you, Curtis. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Jeff, Jeff read the scripture to us, uh, and it's a familiar scripture probably to most of you because we've heard about the rich young ruler before, and we've heard, uh, like Jeff was saying, a lot of things about uh, how giving away all your money is the right thing to do. Selling everything that you have is the way to get into heaven. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that this morning because I don't think that's the truth at all. I think there's a whole lot more to this story than just sell everything you have and you'll be perfect after that. Because I don't think that's what Jesus meant. And I think if we look at it, especially with some context, uh, with some surrounding verses too, we'll notice that Jesus isn't really saying that the way to get into heaven is to sell everything and to give all your money away. So uh, the first thing we have to figure out, and Jeff, if you'll hit that slide, uh, the first thing we have to figure out is who Jesus actually is. Because this man calls Jesus a name, and that's the first thing that Jesus notices about this person's question. When he comes up to Jesus, he says, good teacher. He doesn't call him Jesus. He doesn't call him master. He, doesn't call, he calls him good teacher. And Jesus' response to that is, why do you call me good? 
there isn't anyone but who's good except for God. Which is Jesus' way of saying, if you call me good, then you must think I'm actually God, right? And if he does think that, well, then that changes the conversation a little bit. So this, this rich young ruler apparently believes that Jesus is God. That's, that's the assumption we have to make because Jesus is sort of making that assumption for him and saying, well, if you call me good, you must be calling me God because there's only one who's good, and that is God. So right away, Jesus has established how things are going to work in this conversation. You, you're, you're just man, rich young ruler. Me, I'm God. That's who you're talking to. So now we have the conversation set. Jesus has said, I'm God. You're a man. Then we can see that Jesus knows who this man is from top to bottom, inside and out. He knows this man's heart because if he's God, well, God knows everything about each and every one of us, right? Yes. So the first thing this man is going to say, Jesus knows what it is. Well, everything this man is thinking, Jesus already understands. It. Everything that this man is feeling right now, confronting God, Jesus understands from head to toe, top to bottom. And then, what do I have to do to have eternal life? That's his question. What do I have to do to have eternal life? And we already know the answer to that. Because you and I have studied the scriptures quite a bit. We know what Jesus says about this. We know what the apostles say about it. We know what the prophets said about it. The way to have eternal life is to be absolutely perfect. That's the way you do it. The way to go to heaven is to be perfect. If you're perfect, you can get into heaven. That's the rules. That's why Jesus reigns in heaven. Because he is absolutely perfect. So no, no doubt about it. That's who's in charge up there. So you and I, all we have to do is follow every single rule exactly right every single time. And we can go to heaven too. Because that's the rules. All you have to do is be perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. No problem then. Because if those are the rules, it shouldn't be very difficult, right? I mean, if, if, if you knew all the rules ahead of time, wouldn't you just follow them and no, no big deal, no problem at all? It's crystal clear, but I'm really bad at it. Oh. Well, this man is not really bad at it. Mm. This man, if you'll go to the next slide, this man is not bad at it at all. Because when Jesus lists off the commandments, he doesn't get to all ten of them, but he lists off a whole bunch of them. And when he lists them off, what does the man say? Well, I've done all of that since my youth. Since I was a little boy, I've followed all the commandments perfectly. He has never killed anyone. Well, that's good. Okay. He's never committed adultery. Okay. He's never taken something that didn't belong to him. Okay. Now we're getting into some fuzzy territory. Yes, yes. Because I could probably check the first two off the list. I mean, if we're talking physical actions here, I could check the first two off. But I don't know about that third one. And then we get to the fourth one. Uh, have you ever borne false witness is the way Jesus phrased it. Have you ever lied? And he says, nope, never lied either. Never done that. Cool. And then, has he ever dishonored his parents? I don't know, Miss Julie, you got to tell us. Has that, that anybody ever dishonored you? Or, or better yet, have you ever dishonored your parents? See, it goes both ways, right? Yeah, this, this man has never dishonored his parents, though. Not one time. Not since he was a little boy. Never happened. He always loves his neighbor. No matter what. No matter who the neighbor is, he absolutely loves that neighbor with all of his heart, no matter what, every single day, all the time. Which, which brings the next question, right? Is this man completely perfect? According to him, he is. But according to all of us, we now know what this man is. He is an absolute liar. Not just a liar, but a liar to God's face, right? Looks right at Jesus, who Jesus has established, I'm God, you're just man and says, I'm perfect, Jesus. And then he asks the question, how do I have eternal life? Well, if he's perfect, he's got it, right? That's why the first slide up here said, the man who didn't need Jesus. If you're perfect, you don't need Jesus, right? If you're absolutely perfect, you can walk into heaven, no problem. Because that's the rules. All you have to do is be perfect and you can go. Yes. So this man says, I'm absolutely perfect, Jesus. What do I need to do to have eternal life? Well, number one, he should already know the answer to that question. But number two, he doesn't, he doesn't think he needs Jesus. He's just told Jesus to his face, I don't, I don't really need you, Jesus. So Jesus has something else to say about it. 
This is what the man should have said in response to all those questions. When Jesus lists the commandments, this man should have said what it says in 1 John 8 through 10, which is, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We lie to ourselves when we say we don't have any sin. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we would say, Jesus, I am a sinner. I have done so many wrong things, I can't even keep up with all of them. I confess those things to you. I've broken your law. I am not worthy in any way to set foot in your kingdom. If we confess those sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all that unrighteousness. See, that's what this man should have realized. Jesus wasn't listing off the commandments because he wanted to make sure that man knew how bad he was. He was listing off those commandments to give that man an opportunity to say, you're right, Jesus, I've broken every single one of those laws. Every single one of them. I can't do it on my own. I am not perfect. How can I have eternal life? Well, Jesus is telling you, you got to get cleansed of all your unrighteousness because you're not perfect and you can't get into heaven just like you are. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. We make God a liar. Remember, he's talking to God right now in this conversation. Jesus has already established that. And when Jesus says, have you broken this commandment? Have you broken that commandment? Have you broken that commandment? Jesus already knows the answers. Those are rhetorical questions to Jesus. He knows everything about that man's heart. But then when that man comes back and says, yes, I am perfect. Well, now he's, he's calling Jesus a liar. Because Jesus knows what the answers to those questions are. When we're confronted by the law of God, when God's law sits right in front of us, those Ten Commandments sits right in front of us, we can only confess our sin. That's all we can do. That's the only choice we have. I can't look anybody in the face, especially Jesus himself, and say, nope, never done that. Can't do it. I, I, don't, I can't imagine what this man was thinking. But then again, I kind of can. Because I know I've, I've done it myself too. I've, I've tried to wipe away my own sin. That's a futile attempt. But I've done it. But let's just assume that this man is perfect, just like he thinks he is. And if this man is absolutely perfect, then what else is necessary? Because that's what he says. He says, all of these things I've done since I was a little boy, what else do I need to do? This man insists he is perfect, so there is nothing else for him to do because he can already get into heaven. So why does he ask Jesus anything at all? Why would he even bother? Because the truth is, all the way down in his heart, he knows who he really is. Just like you and I know who we really are. And just like if I told you all of my deepest, darkest secrets, you would all run screaming from this room. And I'd do the same if I heard yours. I can't fathom how horrible everyone in here's heart is, except that I know how horrible mine is. And Jesus knows all of us better than we know ourselves. So he knew this man walking in the door, exactly everything that he had ever thought, everything he'd ever done, all of the worst things this man was, Jesus knew. His sin is so complete that he can't even cover it up. He can't even say, well, that, that one time that I lied, I, I had to do it because this. Or that one time I stole, it was justified because of these situations and these circumstances. He doesn't even attempt to do that. You know how you talk your way out of your sin and convince yourself it wasn't so bad after all? This man doesn't even do that. The only thing this man can do is say, uh, no, it never happened. And just deny, deny, deny. That's all he does. So Jesus has the absolute perfect response to this. His response is, sell all that you have and give it away. That's a great response. Because what's just happened is, we had those Ten Commandments that Jesus listed through. We had those commands in the law. And this man said, oh, I followed all those commands. So what does God do when he's standing right in front of this man? He just gives him one more command. It should be easy to follow one more command because he's followed all the other ones perfectly, right? See what Jesus did? Jesus is saying, well, if you are so perfect and you follow God's commands so perfectly, well, here's one more that you can absolutely follow absolutely perfectly. No problem at all, right, sir? 
Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor. But if, if this man is perfect, then he can do that. He can, he can jump through whatever hoop God puts in front of him because he's been doing it his whole life. So one more command from God is no big deal. But this man had lots of things in his life that he didn't want to sell or give away. That's what the last verse tells us. He had lots of things in his life that he didn't want to sell. He didn't want to get rid of those things. And to get into heaven, we have to give all our money. Right? We have to get rid of everything we own just so we can get into heaven, right? Yeah, that's, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what that verse says either. See, that verse was just one more command. Just to point out some hypocrisy. The Bible says this is how you get into heaven. Romans 10, 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. That perfectly describes that gentleman who's talking to Jesus right now. He is ignorant of God's righteousness. He does not understand what God really wants from him. God doesn't want someone to come in and say, I'm righteous, God. God doesn't want that. God wants someone to come in and say, I am wholly unrighteous. There's nothing righteous about me at all. That's what God wants. Seeking to establish their own righteousness. That's what this man was doing. He lied. And he said, I'm righteous all by myself. I don't, I don't need you to be, make me righteous, Jesus. I'm already, I've already done that for myself. He's tried to establish his own righteousness and it's not going to work. He also hasn't submitted to the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is when you confess your sins, he cleanses you from your unrighteousness. But this man doesn't want that. Because in order to get cleansed from his unrighteousness, he has to admit that he's unrighteous in the first place. But Romans 10 verse 9, just a couple of verses later, says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in all your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what this man is supposed to be doing right now. When he comes to Jesus and he says, how can I have eternal life? And Jesus says, well, just be perfect. He should say, well, I'm not perfect and I need your help, Jesus. That's what he should say. And then Matthew verse, uh, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, which we read just a few weeks ago. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. See, that's how you get into heaven, the narrow gate. The narrow gate where you admit your unrighteousness you confess your sins and you are cleansed from your unrighteousness with the only thing that can cleanse you, and that is the shed blood of Jesus. So all of that is how you get into heaven. This man thinks he's checked all the boxes already. He hasn't checked any of the boxes yet. All he said is, I'm a liar. I don't deserve heaven at all. I'm a sinner from head to toe. That's all he's done. So, what keeps you out of heaven? Right? Well, there are a couple of verses in the Bible that a lot of people attribute to keeping you out of heaven, including one from this passage. Matthew chapter 5, we read this a few weeks ago as well. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So, if your eye causes you to sin, cut out your eye, right? That's why so many Christians only have one eye, right? <laughs> Not to mention the ones that only have one hand, because we've been sinning with our hand too, so we just chop that right off because we want to get into heaven, and that's the way you do it, right? Nobody quotes that verse like no. they do the money verse, right? right? It's a lot easier to give all your money away than it is to chop off your own hand and cut out your own eye. Not a lot of folks go for that. But it's in there. Isn't that what it means? And then 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. Y'all have probably heard this one before. Money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. See, money is the problem. If you got rid of all your money, just like Jesus told this man, if you get rid of all your money then you can go to heaven. That's what it says, right? See how easy it is to take those scriptures and pull them out and say, this is the way to get into heaven. That's what this man was looking for. He wanted Jesus to tell him the secret 
Tell me the secret, Jesus, to get into heaven. I'm perfect as it is, but just tell me that one little thing that I need. If it's, if it's cut off my hand, I'll cut off my hand, no problem. Cut out my eye, yeah, sure. I, I want to have eternal life. If that's all you got to do, or give all my money away. That should be pretty easy, right? Well, this man, that, he didn't want to do that. Maybe there's another option. Maybe he could have cut off his hand and then he would have gotten into heaven. That could have done it. But see, that's, that's not what keeps you out of heaven. Lots of things get in your way. No, not lots of things. Get that next one, Jeff. Here's the truth of it. There's only one thing that gets in your way. It gets in my way too. The only thing that gets in our way is our sinful heart. That's it. When was the last time your eye caused you to sin? My eye has never caused me to sin. It's never happened. My eye has never said, hmm, I think I want to go do this awful thing. It's never happened. My hand has never caused me to sin either. My hand does not make decisions for itself. Does yours? Mine doesn't. My eye doesn't either. My money, my wallet, has never caused me to sin. It's never happened. It's been in my pocket most of my life, and it's never once caused me to sin. Because that's not where sin comes from. Sin comes from our hearts. Some of you might have noticed uh, that I skipped a few words in 1 Timothy 6.10. If you didn't notice, that's okay, because I, I put the whole thing up here. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Right? Money is not the root of all kinds of evil. It's not. Money is what we exchange for goods and services in our world. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, though. Because the love of money means your heart is in the wrong place, right? If you love money, well, sure enough, that's where the evil comes from. If you love anything besides Jesus, that's where the sin comes from. That's what our hearts do. Our hearts are reaching out for something to love. And when they grasp something, terrific, as long as it's Jesus. If it's something else, it's going to lead you down the wrong way. That broad way with the big gate. That's where it leads you. There's only one narrow way. Sin doesn't come from things that get in your way. It comes from a heart that is absolutely given over to sin 100%. That's what it is. It didn't really matter what Jesus said. Jesus' response to the man was, sell all you have and give to the poor, right? But it didn't really matter. The man's heart was already revealed. When he came to Jesus and he said, I'm perfect. I've, I've followed all the commands. I've never sinned. Well, well, what's one more then, right? The, the man's response could have been, oh, I've already done that, Jesus. Gave it all away yesterday. What's the difference, right? The man's response is the same. I don't need you, Jesus. I never wanted you to start with. That was the man's response before the question was asked. The man came to Jesus not wanting Jesus. He came to Jesus with his mind already made up that Jesus wasn't for him. He didn't need any help. He had it all under control. He'd already denied he was a sinner. And if you're not a sinner, you don't need Jesus to save you from anything. So that was the first box he checked was not a sinner. Well, then he doesn't need Jesus. We all know the truth. And so did Jesus from the very beginning, right? Saw him from head to toe. This man was a sinner through and through. And I don't know about you, but I am too. You know what? I do know about you. You are too. We all are. There's not a one of us sitting here who can check off the box and say, yep, I've done everything right every single time. This man lied and said he could, but we can't. So when Jesus reacts to that, he does a couple of things. The first thing he does is question the man's belief in God. And that's what you and I should do too. Whenever we encounter somebody, let's talk to them. Let's figure out what they believe and what they don't believe about God. Because there is a God, and He is the judge, and He is the standard for what is right and what is wrong. And He has made the laws for you and me that determine what is sin and what isn't sin. He's made all those rules. So if the man believes in God, which apparently he does, remember he called Jesus good teacher, well then Jesus treats him as someone who should believe in God. If you believe in God, then you must follow all his commands. Right, sir? And then the man says, well, yes, of course I've followed all the commands. Every single one. So Jesus attempts to point out his sin. He lists the commandments. 
Now that I know you believe in God, let me, let me ask you about some of these commandments. Because if you believe in God, you must believe in his commandments, right? So how about adultery and murder and theft and lying and disobeying your parents? How about all those things? If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. That's all you got to do. And then after, he, after he's told, oh yes, I follow all those commandments, Jesus, then Jesus does one more thing. He challenges the man with a simple yet very difficult thing to do. And it came directly from God's mouth. One more command. That's all you got to do, sir. Follow one more command since you followed all the other ones. Sell what you have and give to the poor. Mark actually tells this same story as well. Luke does too. But Mark's version has a different, uh, well, a slightly different ending. It has a few more uh, things to tell us about how Jesus reacts. Uh, Mark 10, verse 21 is the end of this story in Mark. And it says, Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him. See, Jesus doesn't care if you don't follow the commands. Jesus doesn't care if you lie to his face. Jesus doesn't care if you're a sinner through and through, because we all are. And if Jesus cared about all that, well, we wouldn't have any hope at all. What Jesus cares about is where your heart is. If your heart is all about him, awesome. If your heart is far from him, you have a problem. This sinner was loved anyway. Even though he did all those terrible things and then he lied about it to God's face, Jesus loved him anyway. And Jesus says, one thing you lack. Just one thing. There's one thing, sir, that you don't have. And some people think it's those next words that Jesus says that are the thing that he lacks. So he says, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Some people think that's what he lacks. But that's not what he lacks. Because if it was what he lacked, then all of us would lack it too, right? That's not what he lacks. The next thing that Jesus says is the one thing. He says, and come, take up your cross, and follow me. That's the one thing the man lacks. He hasn't got that figured out yet. He, he doesn't need one more command to follow because that just means he's got one more thing to lie about next time, right? He doesn't need one more rule to break. He needs one thing that he needs to do in order to have eternal life, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's one thing that this man hasn't done. He's done everything else according to him. But there's one thing he hasn't done, and that's follow Jesus. That's the thing that Jesus was telling him to do. He didn't lack selling all that he had. Because you and I know that's not how we get into heaven. He didn't lack giving everything to the poor, even though that's a good thing to do. He didn't lack that. You and I know that. He didn't lack cutting off his hand or cutting off his eye. Jesus wanted him to come and follow me because Jesus is interested in your heart. Remember where sin comes from? Right here. My hand doesn't cause me to sin, and my eye doesn't cause me to sin, and my wallet doesn't cause me to sin, and nobody causes me to sin except me and my sinful heart. That's where it all starts. Right. But if my sinful heart is given over to Jesus, and Jesus is in control, takes my heart, washes it clean, and then leads me because I'm following him, well, now things are different. This man missed it all, though. What was his response to Jesus when he said, I got one thing for you to do. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Oh, and follow me. That's the one thing that I need you to do. Well, his response was, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. What? I thought this was the only question he had for God. What should I do, God, to enter, enter eternal life? If you had one thing you had to do to have eternal life, would you do it? It's easy to nod your head and say yes to that. But then the second question is, well, have you done it? Because, I mean, lots of people know what the rules are, don't they? Lots of people have heard the gospel message. Lots of people have, have heard and seen everything that God has for them. And they say, no, nah, I don't want to do that. And that's what this man did. He heard everything. He had, he had a moment with God that you and I have never had. 
to ask him anything we want to ask him. And he lied to God's face, and then he walked away sad. Not because he had great possessions, but because he didn't want to do the one thing he had to do, which was stop lying. Stop, stop trying to make it on your own. Stop telling people that you're perfect. You're not perfect. You're not even close to being perfect. You just lied to God's face. That's pretty bad. Not a lot of people get to do that, but he did. This doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. This man thought that Jesus was concerned with his money. Jesus doesn't care about your money. Your money comes from him anyway. He, he doesn't need you to have money or not have money. He, he could care less what your bank balance is. That's not what it's about. Just like he could care less how many hands or eyes you have. He could care less. That's not important. What's important is right here. Where is your heart? That's what this man was concerned about. Because your guilty, sin-stained heart will only lead you to one place, and that's not heaven. That's where this man's heart was leading him the one place that wasn't heaven. And Jesus said, I know what you can do to fix it. Come and follow me. That'll fix it. And this man went away sad because he didn't want to hear anything about that. Don't miss what this man missed. Now, I know I'm, I'm talking to a lot of folks this morning who, who haven't missed it. I know that. I don't know all your hearts, though. I don't know deep down what's in there. So if you've missed it so far, get it right. But I know you know a lot of folks that have missed it. I do too. I know there's lots of folks out there that don't know this message, that don't understand that it's not about giving all your money away or cutting your hand off or being perfect. They don't know that that's not how it works. They need to know about that come follow me part, that cleansing of all unrighteousness part. That's what they need to hear. Sin is all that's in our hearts until Jesus washes us clean and gives us a new heart. A new life. We call it being born again. Sin's all there is until that happens. I think I got one more. Uh-uh. Nope. Nope. All right. So, this morning, I challenge each of you, challenge myself, to hear the message that this man missed. The message is, it's not about being perfect, because you're not that. And even if it was, there'd be one more thing you weren't perfect at just like this man figured out. He thinks he's perfect. Well, here's one more thing you can't do. Here's one more mark you missed. That's all it is. If, if, if you're counting on rules to get you into heaven, you broke them all already. It's not going to work. The way to get into heaven, the way to have eternal life, is to be cleansed of your unrighteousness. And the only way to do that is through Jesus. Amen. Mm. Thank you.
thank you so much that we could draw together in your house this morning, come aside from the cares and worries of the world, think about this young man who came to Jesus with a question. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you that you answer our questions and you don't cast us aside when we come to you and ask you why or what or when or where or, or can you make a way where there doesn't seem to be a way. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can always come to you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for hearts that want you more than anything else. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that the world will see our heart as we go through our daily life, the places we go and the people that we see, and they will see a heart that loves you more than anything else. Cleanse us, Heavenly Father, from our sin, our unrighteousness, our wrong thinking, and our wrong ways. Cleanse us, Heavenly Father, and give us that heart that you long for each one of us to have. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join it heirs with Jesus as we travel this side for a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. Thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you.